Blog Talk Radio. us. Praise the Lord. This is Evangelist Janet Taylor, your hostess, coming to you live from Walls of Fire Deliverance Ministry International. You can find us on the web at www.wallsoffiredeliveranceministry. Um, that's www.wallsoffiredeliveranceminn.com. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 1148, uh, Walkertown, North Carolina, 27105. You can contact us through email at jet245 at msn.com, and you can um, um, reach us by phone at Eric. Area code three three six um eight three zero zero six zero one and um if you are led to sow a seed into this ministry, you can do so by um through PayPal or Zelle using the email address of um jet245 at msn.com or you can um you can use paypal or zelle so we want you to know there's two ways that you can sow into this ministry also um i'd like to invite you 
to join us for the sweet hour of prayer. That's every uh, Monday through Saturday from 12 noon to um, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and on Sunday night at 8 p.m. So that's Monday through Saturday from 12 noon to 1 Eastern Standard Time or else you can um, join us on Sunday night at p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, we we would just love to have you uh, join us for prayer because we get together and we pray for um, different people. And um, I'd just like you to know that you're welcome to join us. So let me give you the number. The number is area code 425-436-6333. And the um, access code is 716-5050. Uh, again, that is 425-436-6333, and the access code is um, 716-5050. So, as I said, you are more than welcome to join us for the Sweet Hour Prayer. You know, we just get together and pray because that's what Jesus said. He said, can you not pray with me? for one hour? And the answer definitely is yes, God. So we just want you to, you know, know that you are welcome, and we would like to invite you to join us. Now, um, we the song that you heard tonight is You Are God. You can um, find that on, um, on my CD, A New Beginning, and you can order that by calling the number or email me, and um, it's also on Amazon.com. So uh, the name of that CD is called A New Beginning, and um, God blessed me to write all of the songs. So if you just like to join in and and you want to, you know, enjoy some more of that music, you certainly can, and we welcome you to join us um, for that. So let's go ahead and get started on tonight's message, which is, um, do you still have any fire? Do you still have any fire? So we're going to get started and just go as the Spirit of the Lord leads Mm -hmm. us um, by um, going straight to the Word of God. So our first scripture for tonight is found in Leviticus 6, Leviticus chapter 6, verse number 12 and 13. And it says, And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering. And the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. I Mm -hmm. want to read that verse again. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. And so our topic for tonight is, do you still have any fire? Now, I'm going to cover a lot of scripture tonight, a lot of material, because I want you to get the gist of this message. Now, we know that this is Old Testament because it was when God uh, established the priesthood, and he began to tell them how to set up the tabernacle. You know, God, he uh, He laid it out detail by detail. God left no stone unturned. He told them exactly how to build the tabernacle, and he told them the exact measurement. He revealed these things to skilled 
craftsmen the exact measurement of how things should be built, what they should be made of, whether it should be gold or brass or whatever. He told them exactly how to do this. So they were without excuse. If they didn't do it uh, right, it would be nobody's fault but their own because God laid out the details so plainly for them. And Moses, he carried out God's instruction to the letter because if he hadn't, he would have died a long time ago. And so we saw that um, God spoke to Moses and he told him um, to command the priest uh, about the burnt offering and the altar that uh, it was to be burnt on. And he said specifically that the fire on this altar must never go out. It was to ever be burning. Glory be to God. So even when there was no sacrifice on the altar, the fire on the altar still had to be burning. Glory be to God in the highest. I pray that somebody is getting this. Even now, I'm just getting started, and I can feel the Holy Ghost. And the question that the Holy Spirit is asking the church tonight is, do you still have any fire? Because the fire on this altar it shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. I, I think that is uh, that is just so awesome. That is just so amazing that God would say that the fire on the altar should never go out. Now they had to, the priest had to burn wood on it every morning, every morning. And they had to uh, put the, the burnt offering on the uh, altar also. But the Bible specifically says that God told Moses that the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. So we want to see why God said this. Uh, why would God say that the fire should never go out? And uh, what, how this relates to us today, glory be to God. Just get started. Now, one of the many ordinances and statutes, and you know there, there are uh, hundreds of them, uh, I better say thousands of them, that God um, instituted regarding the tabernacle in the Old Testament was that the fire on the altar had to burn continuously and that it must never go out. And the priests were charged with the task of burning wood on the altar every morning. Now turn with me to the book of Joel chapter 2 and verse 17 because I believe that this has a, 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 a very, very significant meaning uh, in our lives today. Joel chapter 2 and verse 17 says, Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Now, the part that I want to really draw your attention to tonight is where it says, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Glory be to God in the highest. You know, when the priests, which are the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, 
they are making intercession for the people of God. And what they are doing is uh, they are crying out to God. You see, there's, there's got to be a righteous remnant that weeps over the spiritual deterioration of the church today. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. Glory be to God. And so the priests are to weep between the porch and the altar and and, and cry out to God, interceding for the church, saying, spare thy people, O Lord. Now, what we need to understand from this is that God is holy. He is not like any other God. I don't care what a person may say their God is. There is no God like Jehovah. As a matter of fact, let's just get it straight. There is no other God. He is the true and living God. And so the priest had a very specific, specific uh, task. First of all, they were to burn wood on the altar every morning so that the fire would not go out. But in Joel, in the book of Joel, it says, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. So the, 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 the wood Prayer, glory be to God. It is continuous prayer, glory be to God. It is prayer. In other words, the priests are charged with uh, interceding for the people in prayer so that our God, who is holy, when he looks upon our sinful deeds, our sinful behavior, and our sinful acts, he would not destroy us. So there's got to be an intercessor, glory be to God in the highest, who will stand in the gap weeping between the porch and the altar. Now, over in the book of Ezekiel, we are told that God told the prophet Ezekiel to uh, get a man and uh, with a writer's ink in his hand, and he was to go through the camp and uh, put a mark on everyone who sighed and cried over the spiritual deterioration of the people of, of Israel. And those who did not sigh and cry, they were to be destroyed, man, woman, boy, and girl. But those who sighed and cried were to be spared. So we can see the effect of those who are grieved by what we see going on in the church today versus those who don't see anything wrong with it. And they just say, you know, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, uh, God will handle it. God will fix it. But let me tell you something. If there were no intercessors, my God, who could stand today? Who could stand before the Lord? You know, the scripture tells us, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. And then the Bible goes on to, is none righteous, no, not one. But yet we have people in the body of Christ who weep over the spiritual condition of the church today over the lack of holiness, over the lack of, 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 of sincerity, over the lack of seriousness about salvation and, and worship, because people are playing with God today. They do not understand that God is holy. Glory be to God. I believe there's such a lack of teaching on the holiness of God. If man knew how holy God was, he would not do the things that he does. I want to give you an example. When 
Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, offered strange fire on the altar. God slew them. He killed them. He killed them. Why? Because God said that thou shalt not put strange fire on the altar. He instructed them not to do that. Nadab and Abihu went and did it anyway, and it cost them their lives immediately. And these were the sons of Aaron. But God is no respecter of persons. He did not care that they were Aaron's sons. They disobeyed God. And, and, and disobedience is a form of rebellion. It's saying God don't know what he's talking about. God don't know what he's doing. It's saying I know more than God. I'm going to do it my way. And it's trying to usurp authority. God and, and something that man has no authority in. All right, let's look at when Uzzah reached out to touch the Ark of the Covenant, he tried to stop it from toppling over. And when he reached out to touch it, he fell dead immediately. Why? Because God is holy. Not that God is mean, but God is holy. And he touched, good God Almighty, the holiness of God. He touched it because God dwelt in the mercy seat. He did not understand that. He did not understand why no one could touch the Ark of the Covenant with the blood that was sprinkled upon it. My God, on the mercy seat, God inhabited that. So he reached out to keep it from toppling over. But his mistake was, his error was, he neglected to consider the holiness of God. I hope I'm reaching somebody tonight. All right? Then we have Cain and Abel who both offered to God a sacrifice. Cain gave God any old thing. Abel gave God his best. Cain's sacrifice was disdained. Abel's was accepted. Why? Because God gave specific instructions how they were to bring their sacrifice. So, in a sense, I'm talking to you tonight about the importance of following instructions. We all know what a stop sign is or a stoplight. It's there for us to stop, to come to a halt. But there are people who decide they don't want to stop, and they keep going, and many times it costs them their lives. A split-second decision. You see the stop sign, you're in a hurry, you said, I'm going to keep going. And you didn't see that tractor-trailer truck coming. And now they are no longer here. So it is important to follow instructions, but it is super important to obey God. So we see that God said, the fire must never go out. The priests were to put wood on the fire every morning and that it was to be a continual burning upon the altar. The priests were charged with this task. Glory be to God. The priests were charged in Joel with the task of weeping between the porch and the altar because Israel had sunk to an all-time low, and they called a solemn assembly. The men, the women, the children, they even put the animals on a fast. And when they did, the priests wept 
between the porch and the altar, interceding for the people because they knew that God is holy. He is not to be toyed with. He is not to be trifled with. He is not to be played with. When God gives us an instruction, we must follow it to the letter. We cannot be like Saul who did some of what God said do. And Samuel said to him, then what is this that I hear, the bleeding of the sheep? And then he began to backtrack and blame. He began to say, oh, the people, uh, the people, they wanted the best to offer as a sacrifice to God. And he said to him, obedience is better than sacrifice. So he did not fully follow God's instructions. And it cost him his life and his son, Jonathan. So my question to you tonight is, do you still have any fire? Luke 18 and 1 says, men are to always pray and not to faint. The wood that keeps the fire burning on the altar is prayer. It is continuous, consecrated prayer. Glory be to God. The fire represents the presence of God. Let's look at Exodus 40 and verse 38. And it reads, For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journey. The fire, the fire, cloud by day, fire by night. As a matter of fact, the children of Israel did not journey until the cloud moved. They did not move until the cloud moved. Let's look at Numbers, Numbers chapter 9 and verse number 15. Glory be to God in the highest. And this is what it says. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the clouds covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at evening there was upon the tabernacle as it the appearance of fire by night, So it was always the cloud covered by day and the appearance of fire by night. That's Numbers 9 and 15. So the children of Israel did not move until the cloud moved. They knew God was with them. They saw the cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Glory, hallelujah. So my question to you tonight is, do you still have any fire? Because the fire shall burn upon the altar all night. And the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. So let's look at 1 Samuel. Glory be to God. You see, the cloud by day and the fire by night signify God's presence with them. When the ark of God was taken and the light in the temple went out, the glory departed. So let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 5, chapter 4, verse 12 through 22. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside, watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, 
all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, what meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was 90 and 8 years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there have been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of the Lord is taken. Now, this is the worst of the worst news that they could hear. Now, look at Eli's response, it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backwards by the side of the gate, and his neck breaks, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She bowed herself and travailed. She immediately went into labor, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, so you see, there have been four deaths. You got Eli, his two sons, Hophni and Phineas, and now Phineas' wife is about to die. And when the time, about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she regarded not, she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child. Ichabod, saying, the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. Four people died in one day. Two sons Phineas and Hophni, and Phineas's wife went into labor, brought forth a child, named him Ichabod, and then she died. Now, what I see here is what the Bible says in Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Eli was the high priest during this time, and Eli had two sons who knew the role of the priesthood. They knew what the priest could do and what the priest could not do. And they began to abuse and misuse their power. Those two sons were having sex with the women inside the temple. They began to take the sacrifice. They didn't want to take part of it. They would take it all. And Eli has heard what these two young men were doing, and he never chastened them. So you have to correct your children, because if you don't, the Bible says a father chastens whom he loves. And if he's not chasten, he's not a son, but a bastard. God will chasten us when we get out of line, when we get over into sin, or when we just get, you know, off into self. God will chasten us. But they, uh, 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 they were not chasten. 
Hosni and Phineas, they were not corrected. And Eli knew what they were doing. And it cost him his life, and it cost the two sons their lives, and eventually it cost the daughter-in-law. But more importantly, the ark of God was taken. Now, the ark of God was the glory of God. It represented the light because Jesus said in his word, I am the light of the world. That's John 8 and 12. And because Jesus said that he is the light of the world, then the light represents the fire upon the altar that must ever be burning. It must never go out. This is what he says in the word of God. He said, so let your light shine. Ye are the light of the world. Let your light shine that men may see your good works. And that is the light that's in us is Christ Jesus. Fire must ever be burning. upon the altar. So I'm asking you tonight, do you still have any fire? Glory be to God. When the light in the temple went out, the glory of God departed. The name Ichabod means inglorious or no more glory. The glory of God was gone. God had departed from Israel. And this is what We're seeing in many of our churches today here in America, the glory of God has departed. The light in the temple is gone out, and there is no more fire on the altar. So what we're witnessing is churches trying to manufacture a move of God. And they have all of this technology, lights, cameras, action. They turn the lights down low so you can't see what they're doing in there. And they bring in these smoke machines and try to make it look like the glory of God. It's like Hollywood. When the show is over, everybody packs up their cameras, packs up their equipment, and everybody goes home. And we'll come back and do it again next week. The worship is not true worship. It's entertainment. The people are, it's all flesh today. Very rarely will you go in a church and hear true worship. People are not praising God. They are praising men today. Oh, my pastor is this. Oh, my bishop is that. They're bowing down before men and women. And many churches, flame has flickered out. Ask somebody in here tonight, hey, you got a light? That's the modern day version of is there still any fire? Do you still have any fire? Is there still fire burning on the altar? Let me tell you what happens when there is fire on the altar so you will know where you are. When there's fire on the altar, it will burn up all flesh. No flesh can glory in his presence. When there is fire on the altar, it will burn up those nasty attitudes. When there's fire on the altar, it will burn up everything in you that's not like God. When there's fire on the altar, glory be to God in the highest. It will burn up lying. It will burn up hatred, jealousy, and envy. It will burn up backbiting and gossip. When there is fire on the altar, This is why the Bible says men are to always pray and faint not. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. When we are praying, glory be to God. And I mean, show enough prayer. I'm talking about fervent prayer. 
asking God, shine the light on me. And asking him to remove sin from my heart. See, we try to pretend that we don't have sin in our lives. But let's go to 1 John. Let's go to 1 John. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. 1 John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Let me start at the 7th verse. I I, want to go up there. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, heedful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is there still any fire on your altar? Do you still have any fire? Glory be to God. I came across this scripture just the other day. You see, God sent his son, Jesus, to die on Calvary's cross. He took our place. He was the substitutionary sacrifice for sin. He died in our place. Glory be to God. It should have been us because we are the ones that sinned. He knew no sin, but yet he hung on that cross for you and for me. And the purpose, God did, he had one purpose in mind, that he might redeem us back to the Father. Glory be to God. So the work has been done. Glory be to God. But it amazes me. And he sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost so that we would have power, power over our flesh, power to live right, power to love right, power to walk right, power to talk right. But yet, we're still living defeated lives, sexual immorality in the house of God. There's still adultery. There's still wickedness. There's still witchcraft in the house of God. There's still rebelliousness and stubbornness in the house of God. Don't nobody want nobody to tell them what to do. You won't even listen to God. But yet we have the nerve to say that we love God. And so God redeemed sinful man through the blood of his son, Jesus. He paid a price that he did not owe, but he paid a debt that we could not pay. Glory be to God. And he did it so that he could redeem us and put and justify us, put us in right standing. Make us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And the word of God tells us in the book of Jude, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You see, that's what it's all about. He's going to present us faultless before the presence of God's glory. We who have sinned, we who have lied, we who have stolen, we who have done all these wicked, wicked, wicked things. But because we receive Jesus' sacrifice, because we repented of our sins and accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he's going to present us faultless before the presence of his glory. What a mighty God we serve. And after he has done all that he has done for us and filled us with the fire of the Holy Ghost, how dare we say, oh, I'm still me. How dare, that's a contradiction. That's a lot. You cannot be saved, born again of the water and of the spirit and still be you. You trample the blood of Jesus under your feet and make 
make it of no effect when you say that. Because the word of God says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You can't be old and new at the same time. You can't be your old, nasty, cussing self, lying self. You can't be that person and be the new creature in Christ Jesus also. You can't. It's impossible. Old and new are oxymorons. They are total opposites. You cannot be one and the same. You're either going to be old or you're going to be new. But you cannot be both. That's why Jesus said, he said, you either be hot or cold. He said, but if you be lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. You can't be both. So are you hot with the fire of the Holy Ghost or are you cold? And if you're cold, that means you've allowed bitterness to creep in. Unforgiveness is in your heart. Jealousy and envy is in your heart. That's what will make you cold. That's like pouring cold water on your fire. It'll put it out. I'm saved, but I can't stand her. I'm saved, but I I I I just can't work with him. That brother right there, I can't I can't. Where's your forgiveness? Where's the forgiveness that God extended to you? Where is that for the other brother? Do you still have any fire? Is there fire on your altar? Have you lost your love for God? That's what he said about one of the churches in in, in the book of Revelation. He said, you have lost your first love. And you have to go back. You have to go back. You got to get back on the altar. You got to repent. You got to confess your sins to God. Hallelujah, and ask him to refire you. Glory be to God. So you can't you can't just offer God any old thing. You can't give God no strange fire. Glory be to God. Nadab and Abihu made that mistake. Hallelujah, Jesus, and they're not with us anymore. The fire of the Holy Ghost. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Thank you, Lord. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Glory be to God in the highest. Do you still have any fire? On the day of Pentecost, The fire fell from heaven. And I have not read anywhere in the scriptures where the Holy Ghost has departed. So is there still fire on the altar of your heart? Are you still on fire for God? Or has your flame, have you allowed the cares of life to extinguish your fire, bitterness, envy, jealousy, malice, 
Don't let your fire go out. Because the fire of God in you is the presence of God with you. The Holy Spirit will lead, teach, and guide you into all truth. You need the fire. You need the fire of the Holy Ghost. The fire must be ever burning. It must never go out. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Do you still have any fire? Glory be to God. Some people, flame is just about to flicker out. You done lost your zeal. You done lost your love. You done got caught up in the world. And 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 um you don't you don't even know that you 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 do know. You do know that you are so far from God. You don't care about the things of God anymore. It's all flesh. It's all you care about. Self, self, self. And the Bible says that the Lord Jesus told the disciples, if any man will be my disciple, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Now, I know people, people like to make excuses for their little habit. It's sin. It's selfishness. It's saying, I love this more than I love God. But for the believer, it has to be, I love God more than I love this thing. See, when you get to that point, nobody, nobody, will have to tell you you need to stop doing certain things. It'll break your heart to do it. Why? Because you love God more than you love that sin. You love God more. That's when you know the tables have turned. When you started out, you loved that sin more than you loved God because you had not experienced the love of God. You didn't even know what that was really all about. But now that you've been around a little bit, you know. You know how good God is. You know how 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 much he has done for you. You know how he has blessed you and favored you. You know how God has made a way for you out of no way. And you are at a place in your life. where you love God more than you love your sin. I remember when I got to that point where my sin would make me cry. It would grieve me. It would break my heart. Because I didn't want to displease my father. I didn't want to break the heart of God, the one who gave his only begotten son for me. And he, he 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 showed me so much love, so much mercy. I should be dead. But God spared my life. And some of you listening to the sound of my voice tonight, he spared yours too. When the enemy came against you like a flood, God protected you. Some of you were in accidents that you shouldn't have walked away from. And now God has totally healed you. You are walking, talking miracle. And you want to sin against God? Now you want to go back like a dog uh, 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 to your own vomit? That is because you have allowed your fire to dwindle down. Now, how does the fire dwindle down? It dwindles down when you fail to put more wood on the altar. See, I was raised in the country. My grandmother, we didn't have central heat or central air. We had a little pot belly stove 
that burns wood and coal. So I learned from a young age, if you want to be warm, you better learn how to make a fire in that little stove. And I learned how to build a fire and how how to bake that fire at night so that it would burn all night long. If you don't bake that fire right, when you wake up in the morning, it'll be it'll be out. But if you bake that fire right, all you have to do is shake that grate and that fire jump back up in the morning. My grandmother taught me that. And every morning, you had to put more wood and coal on that fire. Glory be to God in the height. Hey, yeah, God. Glory be to God in the height. So what is the wood? The wood is prayer. Prayer. Glory be to God in the height. You put wood on the fire. Every morning, glory be to God. Hallelujah. And what is it? What is it that keeps us from praying? It's our idols. It's the idols. When it's prayer time, we can't we can't be found because of our idols. Say, oh, 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 oh. We're going to have a prayer meeting. Oh, Pastor, I'm not going to be able to come. Uh, I, I got to go attend to my idol. So we're going to have a prayer group, a group of intercessors. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to be able to make it. Uh, we, I, I, I got to go see about my idol. God hates idols. The idols are what blocks us from prayer. Sometimes the idol can even be yourself. Glory be to God in the highest. You see, God hates idols. What is an idol? An idol is anyone or anything that you love more than God. You put it before God. You might say in your mouth, oh, I don't love that more than I love God. But the time, the amount of time that you spend with it shows that that you love that more than God. You're always waxing it and shining it and polishing it up. That's your idol. It can be a person. It can be material possession. It can be money. It can be your position in life. It can be fame. It can even be family members. It can be your children. As a matter of fact, you can be an idol to yourself. And the reason that God hates idols is because the idol was created by human hands. It is lifeless, it is powerless, but yet it assumes power over those who create and worship it. Paul said that an idol is nothing, and those who make them are like unto them. People who worship idols offend God and provoke him to jealousy. I got so many scriptures here tonight on idols. This is why there's no fire on our altars in our life because of the idols. Let, let, let's look at some of these scriptures. Isaiah, Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, verses 9 through 20. Let's look at this. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own willness, witnesses. They see not, nor know, that they may be ashamed. Who form the God or a molten, a graven image that is profitable for nothing. Paul said it was nothing. Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear, and
and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongue both worketh in the coal and fashioneth it with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arm. Yea, he is hungry and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He maketh it with a line. He fitteth it with planes and he marketh it out with a compass and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in his house. He heweth down cedars, he taketh the cypress, the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planted an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself, Yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god, and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image, and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire, with which thereof, which with part thereof, roasteth roast, and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself, and said, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. Now he done cut down this tree, but yet he goes and made this thing, and yet he said that's his God. That's the same way they did with the golden calf. They took the gold earrings out their ears and nose and melted it down and made a golden calf with their own hands, but yet they said, this is our God. They have not known nor understood, for he has shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand, and none considered in his heart. Neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Yea, I have also break, baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He seated on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? My God. My God, my God. Let's look at Psalm, Psalm 135 and 15. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Isaiah 57 and 5. Hallelujah, Jesus. Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rock. God hates idols. He hates them. Let's look at Psalm 16 and 4. Hallelujah. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their name into my lips. And we'll hit one more, which is 1 Corinthians 10 and 14. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. 1 Corinthians 10 and 14. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And this is what it says. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Ezekiel chapter 8, I won't even turn there. God speaks uh, uh, explicitly concerning the idols. Idols in the temple. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And these things extinguish our fire. They cause our fire to go out. Prayerlessness. Lack of true worship. Lack of fasting. 
These things cause our fire to go out. The fire must ever be burning upon the altar. Burn, baby, burn. But what do you do if your fire has dwindled down, flickered out, and almost gone? What do you do? I'm glad you asked. If you don't have no more fire, you need to go back. You need to go back and do your first works over again. Get rid of your idols. They block you from praying, and God hates idols. Let me tell you what God spoke to me on April 13th, 2020. This is what I heard the voice of the Lord say. He said, many of the churches am shutting down. Because they have idols and false fire on the altar. So what is false fire? False fire is entertainment versus true worship. False fire is secret sin and iniquity that the the, uh, leaders of the church and the members don't repent of. False fire is fake prayers. That's not from the heart. You know, they got a book of prayers, and the people get up and read those prayers, and they sound beautiful, but they don't come from the heart, not from the heart of the individual that's praying. That's something he's reading. Manufactured moves that are not of God. Everything got to look good for the camera, but it's not. God ain't in it. Fake glory, the smoke machine, the lack of holiness, and the lack of reverential fear of God. That's false fire. All of that is false fire. The word of the Lord said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So what do you do? Repent and return unto the Lord. Start off. Get back on the altar. Cry out to God. Ask God to forgive you. Repent for allowing the idols to take you away from him. Repent. Repent before it's too late. Get back in your place, in your secret place. And whatever it is that's hindering you, whether it be TV, telephone, your children, whatever it is, turn it off. Get your fire back. God said in his word, the fire on the altar must ever be burning. It shall never go out. In order to live this Christian life, you got to have the fire. We need the fire. The fire of the Holy Ghost. We need the fire. You're not equipped if you don't have the fire. We need the fire so we can walk in the light. Because the tabernacle did not move until the cloud moves or the pillar of fire moves. We need the fire. The fire to lead us and guide us in the path of righteousness. We need the fire of the Holy Ghost. Fire of God's word. He said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We need the fire. So if you have lost your fire, if you no longer love God and desire the things of God like you used to, if you are no longer burning with the fire of God, 
if you no longer have an appetite for prayer or for the things of God, you need to get back on the altar and ask God to burn up everything in your life that is hindering you. We, between the porch and the altar, weep over your sins. Weep over your, weep, hallelujah, weep. And ask God to bring you back into right standing with him, right fellowship with him. You see, a lot of people think, well, I shook the preacher's hand. I got the right hand of fellowship. You need to be in fellowship with God. Right hand of fellowship at the church ain't worth a hill of beans. You need the right standing. You need to be put back in right standing with God. That's the fellowship that you're missing. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. Let your light shine. The light shines in darkness. We need the fire. So if you've lost your fire and the glory of the Lord has departed, we need to get our fire back. Get rid of your idols. Get rid of the abominable things. Get rid of the religious rituals. Get rid of witchcraft and be a cult in the church. Get rid of these secret sins and these secret societies. Get rid of that. It's witchcraft. I've never seen it before on this wise where this witchcraft is coming into this Freemasonry. It's in the church. You're serving another God. It's not the God of the Bible. And you provoke him to jealousy, and you wonder why there's no fire in the church. Because the idol you have your idol on display. In the church. You got it on your car. You want people to know, this is my idol. And God will not. He will not receive you. He will not receive your praise. He will not receive it. He will not. Whereas our prayers are supposed to Be a sweet-smelling fragrance unto God because of the idols. They produce a putrefying stench in God's nostrils. So if you have lost your fire, you need to get back to God. Get back on the altar because the fire on the altar must ever be burning. It must burn continuously and it must never go out. Glory be to God. When God sent the fire of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, I have never read anywhere in the scripture where he came and took the Holy Ghost back. We're going to need the Holy Spirit until we leave here. The Holy Spirit is not an it, it's he. Third person of the Trinity. Get your fire back. Don't go out like that. Don't let your fire flicker out. Whatever has poured cold water on you, 
You need to ask God to forgive you, repent of it, and get your fire back. This is Evangelist Janet Taylor coming to you live tonight from Walls of Fire Deliverance Ministry. Hallelujah. International. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 1148 from Walkertown, North Carolina, 27105. You can reach us on the Internet at www.wallsoffiredeliverancemin.com. Also, our email address is jet245 at msn.com. And you can contact us by phone at 336-830-0601. If this message has blessed you and you desire to sow into this ministry, you will be sowing into good ground. And the phone number here, in order to sow through PayPal or Zelle, use this ID, jet 245 at msn.com. Don't forget to join us Monday through Saturday at 12 noon and on Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the sweet hour of prayer. 425-436-6333. That phone number is 425-436-6333. And the access code is 716 Five zero, followed by the pound sign. With uplifted hands, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That comes from Hebrews 13, verses 20 through 21. This is your hostess, Evangelist Janet Taylor. I bid you good night, and may God richly bless you. I pray that tonight's message has blessed you and has brought some clarity to you. Remember our God is holy. And because we serve a holy God and we are his children, he said, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's First Peter 1 and 16. God bless you and good night.